guys. Welcome back to the Sometime in the Daytime show. I'd say good morning or good afternoon, but since we don't really know when the show's being filmed, I think I'm just going to have to say uh, happy ambiguous time of the day to you. So uh, that's, I guess, how we'll greet each other from now on here. Uh, today is a very special day. It is Mother's Day, and so we wanted to take a moment to honor and recognize our moms and everything that they do for us and how great they are with a very special mother's segment of making it or faking it. And then we'll do a little bit of teaching from Habakkuk and another word from our seniors. So welcome to the sometime in the daytime show. Let's start with making it or faking it. So on this very special mother's day segment of making it or faking it, I'm going to see if you guys can figure out um, some, either whether it's true or not true, some statements about some very special mothers from the animal kingdom, uh, just to help us remember all the great things that our moms do for us. So, the first one, when a baby koala, which is known as a joey, is born, their bowels are not strong enough to digest the poisonous eucalyptus leaves the koala's main diet consists of. Until the baby joey is old enough to digest the poison, the mother koala will chew its own feces and then feed it to the baby. So, making it or faking it? Well, uh, th that is a true level of dedication that the mother koala goes through. So, um, I guess, kids, be glad that your moms don't have to do that for you. But the mom of the baby koala, they definitely do. So, let's go to number two. When baby earwigs are born, they are hidden in eggs with tough outer shells. The mother earwig will help break down the thick coating of the egg's shell by repeatedly eating, digesting, and pooping out the eggs until the coating is soft enough for the baby earwigs to break through. All right, making it or faking it? Well, uh, the mother earwigs do a lot to help their babies, and they do help break open the shells, but they do not do that by eating and then pooping it back out again. So. This one is a faking it. Um, although there's a little bit of truth in there, it's, it's a false one. All right, number three. The mothers in a particular species of bird known as the red knob hornbill, which, yes, that is a real bird, will stay in the nest with their young for two months after birth, using their feces to block the doorways of their nest so the predators cannot enter in. Um, I didn't realize until just now that this is a Mother's Day but there's another uh, theme running through all these, and that is dealing with poop. Um, there's no relation between Mother's Day and poop. Just want to make that clear. Uh, this is true, however, um, and it's a great self-defense mechanism. I can imagine if, if you were a predator of a red knob hornbill, whatever animal that is, and you were trying to break in, and that's what you had at your doorway, I think I would leave that well enough alone. The last one. Uh, a female octopus will go to the extremes to protect her 200,000 eggs. Uh, many will, are known to starve themselves and even eat their own arms so they don't have to leave the nest and the eggs vulnerable. Um, that is true. I mean, the fact that they would eat their own arms, that's another great level of dedication. So, if you've been keeping track at home, uh, the real winner today, because it's Mother's Day, is your mom. Even if your score is better than her, your mom still wins. So just go give her a hug or something. Well, thank you guys for playing Making It or Faking It. As we move into Habakkuk today, I just wanted to take a second real quick recap last week. If you guys remember, we read the first 12 verses from Habakkuk 1, um, where Habakkuk was wrestling with God um, because he sees that the Babylonian nation is about to invade you know, his nation, the people of Judah, and Habakkuk is wondering, like, God, how, how could you let this be happening? What's going to, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, and so Habakkuk brings this question to God. And we see through how God answers Habakkuk and then how Habakkuk responds to God answer um, this following kind of summary, main point, whatever you want to call it, that 
we can't understand how God works apart from him. But we know that in whatever God does, he's upholding righteousness and he's executing judgment. Um, and we, we looked at that and, and we saw at the end how Habakkuk says, okay, I, I understand that, God, and I get that that's where you're going, but I, I still am wrestling with this. And, and he brings another question to God, and that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, we are going to read a ton of verses, uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, and the entirety of chapter 2, uh, but stick with me because there's some really, really cool stuff that goes on in here. So grab your copy of God's Word, flip open to Habakkuk chapter 1, meet you there in verse 13. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13 and following. You who are of pure eyes to see than evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors? Uh, just real quick, this is Habakkuk talking to God. Uh, why do you look idly at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. And therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will stand, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never had enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own, for how long, and loads himself with pledges? Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoil for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets his evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink, you who pour out your wrath and make them drunk, in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them, for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, Arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Okay, thanks for sticking with me. There's a ton of verses, but it's, it's not too terribly complicated to unpack what's going on. So hopefully, as we explain it, you guys can see some of the amazing stuff that Habakkuk was saying in there. So his, his second question to God comes in verses 13 through 17. And, and Habakkuk's basically telling God, 
okay, I, I get that I can't understand what you're doing, and I know you're upholding righteousness and executing judgment, but God, I, I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing how my people are under the threat of this invasion, and there's no way that any good is going to come from that. Why are you working in this way? And guys, I think these these two questions that Habakkuk has are ones that you and I probably you know struggle with all the time. I, mean, I I'll share later, but there's definite moments where I I walk through periods struggling with both of these, where you've got this this question of how you know how are you at work in all of this, God, and this question of why you know God, why are you choosing to work this way? And so Habakkuk, you know, in chapter one, he asked the question how, and now we're getting to the why. And God kind of gives him an answer uh, in three parts throughout the chapter. And uh, in the second, the last two parts kind of go together. But as God unpacks um, his answer to Habakkuk, he just simply starts by first telling him you know, that I work on my timing. So, so our first little point is that you know, God works on his timing. And I love, I love chapter 2, verse 3, because, and I'll read it again just because of how great this is. And when God sees um, Habakkuk wrestling with this, he says, Write the vision, this is 2, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. And then 3, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Basically, God's saying, look, Habakkuk, you're going to go through some really rough times. And I know it's going to be really difficult for you to remember all this that I'm telling you. So write it down so you don't forget it. And then he says, and also know this, Habakkuk, that I am working towards something that is, you, I can't tell you when that's going to be completed. That's not for you to know. But God has this end goal in mind that he's working towards. And so when, when we try to figure out, well, why is God doing this? It's not just like, oh, I'm going to do this for this to happen. Now, God has this, this plan that he's working towards, and it's going to take a, you know, a chunk of time to get to his end goal. And so because God is working towards that, he tells the back at first, look, don't worry. I'm working on my timing. I've got this. And then as he goes throughout the rest of the chapter, he kind of unfolds, what is this end goal he's working towards? I think this end goal uh, has two parts to it. The first part is that God is working to reveal his glory to the nations. Um, so after you get through God's initial response to Habakkuk of, you know, I, I'm working on my timing, you get to verse 6 and all the way through 13, you know, God has is, is kind of flipped the script. In chapter 1, he's talking about all the things that are going to happen to the people of God because of what the Babylonians are going to do. And then now in chapter 2, God says, but I'm, I see what's coming, and here's what's going to happen to the Babylonians after they do all of that stuff. And it kind of culminates in verse 14, where, where God tells Habakkuk, the reason all this is coming is so the knowledge of my glory may be made known to all the nations, where God is working for part of his end goal to be revealing his glory to the nations. And now when we talk about the word glory, it, I realize it's one we kind of throw out a lot in church. And so just to clarify what we mean by that, the glory of God is kind of basically the, the godness of God. It's, it's just the, the fullness of who God is. You know, when you and I glorify something, we are making everything about that we're trying to glorify known to everybody. So when God talks about making his glory known to everybody, he's saying, I'm going to make every part of who I am known to everyone. The fullness of who I am is going to be known among the nations. And so whatever God is working on, he's working to reveal who he is to everybody. But there's kind of a a part two to that, because it's it's not just about God revealing his glory to everybody, it's also about him revealing his authority. And we get that in the, the second kind of half of the chapter in verses 15 through 20, when God kind of goes back to telling Habakkuk more about what's going to happen to the Babylonians. Uh, and we get these two little indicators that God's talking about authority. 
Um, the first comes in verse 16 where you get that, that statement about the cup is in God's right hand and he's pouring it out and people drinking from it. If that sounds confusing, uh, I, we could take a whole nother video to discuss what that really means. But simply put, the language of God's cup and either drinking from it or him pouring it out is consistent throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament where it's God executing his judgment. That God's wrath is often described as like wine in a cup. And so if people are drinking from it or if God's pouring it out, that's God executing his judgment on the nations. And then that's kind of further clarified in verse 20 where you see the picture of God in his temple and he's seated. He's, he's on his throne. That is where the priest, the king, would sit in power. And so if God is pouring out his judgment, he's exercising his authority. So what this means for us that, that God is working to reveal his authority is we talked about this a little bit in the last video. But when God is exercising his judgment and upholding his righteousness, what he's doing is he's making the statement that whatever is sin, you know, whatever is brokenness, whatever is you know, that which separates you from me, there's going to be punishment on that. And that means that's going to be eternally you know, kept apart from me because sin cannot be in my presence. And because there's a punishment and that who, what, whoever or whatever has sinned is going to be kept apart from me, there has to be a way to be made right again so that you know, there, there's some way of you know, being restored in a relationship with God. And so whenever God carries out his judgment, he is punishing sin and he's upholding righteousness and he, only he has made a way to kind of bridge the gap for whatever's in sin to somehow be made right with him. And so you, God is not just revealing who he is with his glory, but he's also revealing what he's done to the nations. He's basically telling the nations, look, all of you guys who do not know me, you are not living for me. And so that means you're, you're living for sin. You're living for something, anything other than me. And because of that, you cannot be in my presence, but I have made a way to be restored to me. So kind of taking all these three pieces and fitting them together, we kind of get this main picture of God's answer to Habakkuk, where, where God is saying you know, that, that he works on his timing to reveal his glory and his authority to the nations. And another way of saying that would be that God works on his timing to reveal who he is, and what he's done to the nations. Now, why we care about this, and this is kind of the cool part, because this is where Jesus comes into the picture, okay? Because what God is telling Habakkuk is that in everything that God is doing, he is intentionally, you know, on his timing, working to reveal who he is and what he's done to everybody. And the clearest fullest, most beautiful picture we get of that is in Jesus Christ, guys. And Jesus is God himself becoming flesh, becoming man, and coming down to earth and living out not, not just like a good picture and not just like some descriptions of what it would be, but literally living as God among man, where you and I are, are not just seeing a reflection of God, but we are seeing God in person. I mean, this is this is amazing. God has chosen to reveal his glory to us by literally becoming one of us and showing us what that looks like. And not only that, I mean, that, that would be enough. But not only that, that God through Christ's death and through Christ's resurrection has revealed to the nations, and this is what I'm working towards. I am coming to get rid of sin, and I'm coming to make it a way for you to be made right with me again. And so through Christ's death and resurrection, God says, look, this is the this is what I've been working towards, of showing you that you have been broken apart from me, that I, I made you to be with me. You are not with me right now because of sin. And there's no way for you to be made right with me unless, unless I step in. And I take that cup of my wrath and I pour that out onto myself instead of you. So guys, when you and I are in Christ, that punishment gets put on Christ instead of on us and we are made right with God. That is amazing. You guys, you are looking 
had a perfect picture of the gospel in one of the Old Testament minor prophets. I mean, is that is that not mind-blowingly cool? I just, I love this. You can go anywhere in scripture. You can see these themes and these elements. It is, is amazing. So what this means for us, you know, and, and why, why do we care about this? Um, just to share a personal story, there's, there's been times in my life where I really needed to remember this. Um, and, and not remembering this really gave me a lot of worry and anxiety over the situation I was facing. Um, in college, I really wanted to be in a dating relationship. And I thought I had all the good reasons for wanting to be in a dating relationship. You know, I, I wanted to walk with somebody. I wanted to grow my faith. I wanted to share, you know, life alongside with somebody. And I saw at the college ministry I was involved in that, you know, I had some good friends who were godly women that I probably, you know, could have pursued some of those relationships with. And, and it, it was just frustrating to me because I felt like God kept closing doors and, and not allowing things to happen. And, and so I just got really mad at him one night and just was like, God, why are you doing this? I have all the right intentions. Why, why is this not working? Uh, and I can still remember one of my best friends um, telling me, Jordan, you, you might you might not be ready for something like that. God might be really trying to to impress upon you and teach you something in this season. And he he kind of helped me see that, you know, for me, God wasn't going to bring me a relationship with somebody else if I couldn't be content with my relationship with God. I'm not saying he teaches you that in every season and, and that, um, you know, if you're single, that's the exact same thing that God's trying to teach you. But, you know, even, even if I look at that season where God was kind of, you know, keeping relationships from happening, I could look at that and say, well, he, he's just waiting to bring me somebody better and Abigail. And that's definitely true. But I think what's really neat about the way God works is that he has things about himself that he wants to share with us and that it really doesn't matter what our present circumstances look like he's always going to reveal those things to us you know the the purpose of me being single wasn't so that I would wait for Abigail it was so that I would see more of who God is and what God's doing and God chose to reveal more of who he was and more of what he'd done for me in Christ in that you know, that season of being single and then thankfully he chose for that to happen through you know dating and then being engaged and now married to Abigail I mean I I've enjoyed this season a lot more than that one I can tell you but but just to share with you guys whatever you're going through I, I, I wish I could tell you exactly how it's going to play out and how it's going to work out and and it's really really hard um, when you don't know the answer to that and, and what I, I keep seeing as we read through Habakkuk is, is God keeps telling Habakkuk, that's not what I want for you. I don't want you to spend your whole life asking, how are you working, God? Or why are you working in this way? I mean, in everything God does, he does on his timing so that each one of us and, and all the nations would be able to see who he is and all his glory and what he's done in Christ because of his authority. And so when we when we kind of keep this in mind, that's going to lead to uh, three discussion questions that I'd love to share with you guys for your families this week. Uh, the first discussion question is, when you don't know why something is happening, how do you respond? The second question, what's going on in your life right now that you don't understand why it's happening? And the third one, the challenge comes with this, in what ways do you see God trying to teach you more either about who he is or what he's done for you in Christ in your life right now? And the challenge is simply just spend some time reflecting on this last question and write down you know, whatever your answers or your thoughts are. Guys, I encourage you, whether you have a relationship with the Lord or not, uh, he, he is at work and through whatever you're going through or not going through, or whatever you're you're facing, the different situations you're in, the people that are or aren't in your life, whatever you're going through, God is at work 
teaching you more about who he is and more about what he's done. And I think it's it's really peaceful for us knowing that God doesn't want us to figure out all these exact details of how and why, but he says, learn more about me. Look at what I am trying to show you about me. Keep your eyes focused on me. I'll take care of everything else. I've got all the details figured out. I know how this is going to play out. Don't worry about that. Look at me. And, and, and guys, I, it's... It's really tough to explain, but that honestly is the most peaceful place we can be at in our lives when we're not worried about the details and we're focusing more on God. Uh, in the last chapter of Habakkuk, we're going to kind of see this on display in Habakkuk's own life, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and and really, this is, this is what Abigail and I want for you guys. We want you to understand and to see for yourselves you know, what is God doing and, and who is he? And guys, that's that's why we do everything we do for the student ministry. That We just, we want to equip you guys to, to get this and to live this out. Uh, so I hope we're doing that in these videos while we're apart. I look forward to getting to do it um, when we get to meet together again in person. Uh, we miss you guys. We love y'all dearly. Um, and we've got a special word of encouragement from another one of our graduating seniors. <music> Hey y'all, I'm Josh and I'm going to be talking a bit about perseverance. Romans 7.25 says, Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans 7, Paul talks about his own struggle with sin and the requirements of the law. But he is able to end on a joyful note. He exclaims, Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's struggle is the same as our struggle. Who would even begin to claim that they did not fall short? Who could claim to go a whole day without stumbling into one sin or another? With Paul, we can say honestly, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Philosophers of the past tell us, but God is faithful, merciful, strengthening us in grace, and powerfully preserving us in it to the end. And as Paul writes in Philippians 1.6, we can be confident that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God does not fail and will not fail. He has the world in his hands, and he has engraved in us on his palms, Isaiah 49, 16. This is comforting assurance, which leaves us believers to a shout, Thanks be to God. Although we are all going through a tough time right now, we must all continually give thanks to God for what he has still blessed us with. We as Christians must try not to stumble, especially when our faith is being tried. Perseverance is a key part of our walk with Christ, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. As a senior, I am going through this just as much as the rest of you, but I implore each of you to continue to take this in stride as a test of your faith in God, to continue to persevere, and most importantly, to share your faith and grow in it throughout your own struggles or others. Thank you, and I pray for all of y'all's safety.